Uh, we'll let you know when it come, time comes. Good morning, everybody. This is the, well, actually, let me do this first. Why does it not unfreeze it? Okay, I think that's it. Yep. Good morning, everybody. This is the Macro Church of Christ. This is uh, uh, April the 9th. Remember that we're doing this online for those of you who cannot be here for the morning service. Uh, our, our parking lot is on today, so if you're in the parking lot, we hope you can hear us. Uh, if you are watching this online, remember our goal is to get you here in person with us so that we can fellowship with one another as God wants us to. Make sure you have your Bible. Uh, you should have a copy of this audio if you're watching it right now while, while you download it. Uh, you can also get a copy of the sermon outline, I think, online, if I remember right. And you can also get, if you need unleavened bread or the grape juice, you need to call us and we'll send one of our deacons over or, or somebody will come and, and give you some containers. If you don't have any, you need to have that in order to partake of the Lord's Supper with us. But hopefully you can be here with us in person so that we together can worship the Lord. Uh, I don't have any other announcements to be made and we're going to start a little different today because we're going to have a song to start off with. And so if you have a if you have a songbook, uh, you might pick up song number 565, or you can watch it online. I mean, on the overhead. Does it work? No. All right. Good morning and happy Easter. Amen. Is Lord. We're glad that you made it out in order for us to worship on what they refer to as the Resurrection Day. Uh, remember that there is We Worship for those who have children that are between the ages of 2 and 10. Uh, Brother Sandy is here, and so make sure that your kids go back there at the appropriate time. We'll let you know when if you haven't. This is your first time here. All of our songs are on the overhead, so you can follow along with us uh, and uh, sing with us. If you can't see the overhead, there are songbooks underneath your seat. Make sure that you grab a, a, a songbook so that you can sing with us. We intentionally do not have a band nor a choir because God expects all of us to sing. God expects all of us to praise him with the voices uh, and our hearts because we are so appreciative of who he is that we want to sing to him. doesn't mean that we sing necessarily in key, though we like to, uh, but it does mean that we sing with the heart, and that's what matters. And so we're, we're, we ask you to, to take a deep breath and follow along as we're getting ready to be led in song my brother Bill, our we worship for today is about, of course, the resurrection and the empty tomb, what Sandy's going to be covering. Our first song is number 528, and if you would, sit up straight and let's praise God. Oh, uh-huh. 
page 13. Alleluia. And <clears throat> what I've done in the past with this song is say we will sing all five verses. And if you look at the song, there's only four verses in there. But we will read. I didn't ask you to repeat the first. Everybody knows the first verse anyway. <laughs> and if you know the discount for that, there's a high soprano that a few of the sopranos know. If you know that, you can sing it on the fifth verse. Uh, my daughter and daughter-in-law know that really well. I never learned it because I'm singing soprano. I uh, <laughs> really love the fourth verse. So when we get to pay particularly close attention to what you're singing. Alleluia. morning on this Easter Sunday. Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you for just putting breath in this frail body, Lord. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to see you. I miss you so much. And I thank you for the cause, the cause, and everything that you sent to me. Man, I love you. I miss seeing your faces that I 
That's what brought me out of my sickness, just knowing that I'm going to be back, able to come back here and just look at all these beautiful faces I'm seeing up here this morning. Amen. Lord, have mercy. I sure hope you don't go too much, get too much Easter eggs in you. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord. Protect us, Lord. Watch over us, Lord. And just continue loving us, Lord. Just continue loving us. But we need you. We need you. Not only on Easter Sunday, every day. Did you? Yes. I did for you too. Amen. I did for you because I know that God wants me to just continue loving you and praying for you. You know? I have to look around and see. And just look and see all of you. I mean, this, this, is, this is what I live for. The Sundays that I have to come here and just, just, just be with you. And I hope you feel the same way about me. But don't get the COVID. I mean, it, it takes something out of you and it never leaves you. It always leaves you with something, you know. It takes something away from you and it leaves you with something. But God always going to put something back in you. If you lose something, he's going to put something back in you to make you recover more from what you did have before. You know. So just continue loving him and keep coming to service and keep reading your word. Keep your nose in the book. And just keep reading the word of God and just... Just love him because he loves you. Amen. Shall we go to God in prayer? Yes, sir. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father. Thank you for just letting us enjoy the time that you give us upon this old wicked world. Lord. Thank you for just blessing us and keeping us on straight street, Lord. And when we do it, we get hard-headed, Lord. We get to be where we can't understand what you really want us to know. Just give us a little kick or a little shove and just push it back on the right path. We'll be obedient to you, Lord. Although we'll be stubborn, but we'll listen. It might take a couple of swipes, a couple of kicks, a couple of push. All of this it takes for us, Lord, because that path to walk on is not an easy path. It's a hard path. Especially when you get up in age and you're getting up on, coming up on the rough side of that mountain and you're trying to make it. And you just say, God, just... Give me a little push. Give me a little strength. Strength in these bones that's in this old body, Lord, that's just trying to make it over the hill. And Lord, I'll do what you say, dude. And I'll be obedient to you, Lord. I'll walk in your statutes and I'll obey your commandments. And thank you for the breath that you put in this body. May I continue breathing and continue feeling and continue loving and just, just continue doing the things that's righteous on this earth, Lord. And learn to be holy. And keep my nose in the book and read your most gracious and holy word, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Like you said, the Bible. The Bible is basic instruction before leaving earth. And that's what you have to learn what these instructions are. And I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blessing, your mercy, your grace. And may we attend this service that we have today, Lord. That the word that's been brought to us by my brother Mike. And I pray, Lord, that it would open our eyes and enlighten us and May we be edified from the word, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to my petition for all of my people. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Yes. Yes,
morning to the family of God that meets here at Mac Road. Leroy's right. We love you, and every time we come to see one another, it's like we're home. It's, uh, it's not like that everywhere in the world. Some churches may not be, as a group, active like you are, teaching the gospel like you do, and are examples like you are. Apostle Paul had a lot of things happen to him during his life after he saw Jesus and after his life changed and he became a Christian and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He didn't care about his own life. He was beaten. He went through a lot of things that none of us want to go through. But the one thing he did is he cared for every soul in every one of the Lord's churches in those, all those localities from Ephesus to Thessalonica to Antioch. He cared for the people. The church is the people. You are the Lord's church. And some say, uh, we went, met with my kids up in that Reading yesterday, and we sat outside this little coffee house after we had lunch, and we talked about, and sometimes I brag about you, of the works you do. And my son said, well, Dad, you can't work your way to heaven. I said, no, you can't. But those that have obeyed the gospel from the heart and been buried with Christ in baptism to contact that blood and rise to walk in newness of life, appreciate what Jesus has got and have done for us because we didn't deserve it, but he did it anyways because he loved us. Amen. Just like the song Bill sang, it's a beautiful picture. It's the truth. And it really did happen. And there's more historical evidence for Jesus of Nazareth than for anybody that ever walked on the earth that people would just examine it, read from the scriptures, gain faith, Obey the gospel and be saved. People say, why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? And of course, since your nose is in the book every day for the rest of your life, you take them to Acts chapter 2 because they did it. They were added to the body when they obeyed the gospel and were buried with Christ in baptism and their life started. True life is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Ephesians 1.3 And then we have that hope of eternal life forevermore. No matter what happens, like Mike says, in this world or in this country, or no matter what's going on, God's in charge. He knows who are his. And those that walk with him and follow Jesus will have eternal life forever. It's going to be way better than this. But when we come together, this is pretty good. <laughs> when I get to see you and you edify, and we edify one another by just being here, by just loving the way you love. God does love us. He did send his son, the perfect for the imperfect. It's almost unimaginable to think that I'm the one that decided should have been on that cross because he had no sin, but it was the only way that we could be saved, that the perfect for the imperfect. So this day and every first day of the week, not just on what the world recognizes as Easter, but every first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread, 1 Corinthians 11. And we're going to do that until the day he comes, until the day we die. Amen. And then we'll forever go home to be with him. What an amazing thing. The Christians were first called Christians in Antioch. And we wear that name with humility and, and a godly pride, if there is such a thing. So let us open up our little uh, emblems here. The unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. Let us go to God in prayer and thankfulness for what he's done for us. And since we as humans sometimes forget, he was so wise to have us partake of this memorial feast every first day of the week. So let us bow down. Holy Father, through Jesus we come to you. We thank you for this unleavened bread. We thank you for the body of Jesus that hung there in our place when he did not deserve it. But Father, you... And your Son, your Holy Spirit, were always there from the beginning, and you've always been there for us. Father, we thank you for giving us life and giving us spiritual life in Jesus. For without Jesus, there is no life. There's no blood. There's no body. But he rose from the dead, the only one that ever did. He is our Lord and our Savior, Father. Thank you so very much. As we partake of this bread, Father, we pray that you'd help us, that it would cause us to examine ourselves, that we would discern the body of Christ 
that we would see how much that this is everything to us. And this is everything to Christians throughout the world. So help us to gain more faith, hope, and love for all those that are outside the body of Christ, that we would draw them with your word, with your love, and that you would draw them through us to you. And we give thanks, Father, for all those that are in Christ Jesus here and those that will become Christians because of your love within the members of the body of Christ here to go out and love the world and bring them to you. So, Father, thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. The book of Hebrews, it talks about Jesus. Those that followed the Old Testament back in the day, it was to guide them, to bring them to Christ. And it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without Jesus shedding his blood on the cross, there is no taking away our sins. He did that. And you contacted that in baptism when you were buried with him, Romans 6. Let us go to him again. Our Father, we bow down to thy almighty throne of grace. And we thank you for your tender mercy and your love and your continuing blessings on the saints here and throughout the world. We pray, Father, that you would help us to grow closer to what Jesus is and was and always will be. That we would gain faith and hope and love for our brethren to do whatever they need us to do. And for those that are without, that we will just love them so much, forgive them, and bring them to you. That they would truly understand what it means to be thy child and enter into life in Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray. Amen. Amen. Also in the Corinthian letter, it talks about those that have entered into Christ and are members of the Lord's body in a certain location, that they first gave themselves to the Lord and surrendered all to Him. That's what makes an offering, a free will offering on the first day of the week so easy. Because everything that we are and everything we have is because of God and Jesus. So this is what we're wearing. It's, it's nothing. He gave it to us. What we're driving or where we live, that's all temporary. But what's important is your soul. And we love each other and we'll help each other all the way to the end. Whether it's Christ coming or we pass away. And then we live forever. So let's give thanks for everything God's done for us and given to us. And entrusted with us, the souls of family members. If they're going to hear the gospel, they're probably only going to hear it from you. So we have a responsibility to our children, our grandchildren, to their children. And those that we know and care about, our friends and our neighbors... We have to plant the seed. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? They say, no, not right now. And then you say, you know what, whenever you're ready and you feel the need to come to the Lord or to understand what the will of the Lord is, we'll sit down and read it together. And we'll both do that. It doesn't take much to show someone you really care about them. Because we don't want to see a, a person we've been living beside for the last 10 or 20 years or more pass away. And then that song is in the back of our mind. You never mentioned him to me. Don't let that happen. Love someone enough to share with them the gospel. And that is being done by you. I know that. And so, thank you for working the works of God that are authorized in the word because you love him and want to sh share him with others. Thank you for doing that. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy Father in heaven, everything we have and everything we are is because of you and your Son and your Holy Spirit that confirmed the word, the signs following your apostles. And you bless us every single day to help us to grow as we feed from thy word. Without thy word, we cannot grow. We would lose hope. Without you, there is no hope. So Father, help us to help others find you. Help us to become in heart, in works of righteousness that you have authorized in your word. Help us to be what you want us to be, to love like you want us to love, and to draw all men and women to you. Father, thank you for everything you've done for us. 
We pray that you bless all the saints here, especially Mike and Katie, Bill and Linda, Greg and Patricia, all the members of the body. And we say you ask you for long life and good days for our leadership. They're good men and good ladies and excellent examples. So help us to appreciate what we have here and to continue to grow in the faith and go on into perfection. In Jesus' name, amen. Of the journey. The, pe- the people spoke against God and Moses. 
Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food in the water, and we loathe this miserable food. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. Amen. Time to take your children to We Worship, if you have them, between the ages of 2 and 10. Brother Sandy's back there to take care of them. Well, this is going to be the third sermon you hear today. It's good to see all of you here with us. We're glad the Lord's blessed you. Uh, if you have a Bible, you might open it up to the book of Numbers, because we're going to be skimming the book of Numbers in a little bit. And if you have a Bible open, it might be you some good. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles underneath your, your chair where you can take a look at them. And if you don't have one right underneath your chair, there's probably one in your neighbor's chair. Find one. You can follow along with this in just a minute. What we're looking at today is Jesus, our life after death. You know, a lot of people come and they worship God on Easter because, as most people know, that's supposed to be the day Jesus rose from the dead. But there's a reason for that. There's a reason that we need to understand that. As God was leading the children of Israel into the wilderness, God was trying to teach them to focus on Him. I want, I want to remind you of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1, that it says that the law had only shadow of good things to come. And in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, it says that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law was designed not only to teach the children of Israel some things physically, but it was also designed to teach them things spiritually if they had a spiritual mindset which they needed to have. And so as we talk about this story that we just read on the, uh, up, up on the, uh, on the board, as we take a look at that, I want you to understand that there's a setting that that comes from. And the setting started in Numbers 12 and down to, verse tw uh, to chapter 20. So if you have a Bible, like I said, open it up and we'll take a look real quick. We're going to skim some of the things that are in there. If, by the way, this is your first time here, notice there's blank spaces on the overhead or on your card. Those blank spaces are un underlined on the overhead. So you can write those words in there and, and to follow along with this. Some people find it e easier to stay on task if they do that. And so as, as we take a look at Numbers in chapter 12 all the way to chapter 14, we have the spies in the promised land. Now, if you don't know what that means, that means that the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea and they received the law, God promised to give them a land. That land was the, the land of Canaan. They got to the land of Canaan, and when they got there, the spies said, we can't take it. We can't. They're too strong. The cities are too big. They're well fortified. They have armies. And we're just these slaves that came out of Egypt. And so God was displeased with them. And God said, because you don't believe me, because God said, I'm going to give it to you. The same God that brought the ten plagues on Egypt, the same God that divided the Red Sea, the same God that took care of the, of the, the people that got in front of them as they wandered in the wilderness, the same God that did all that, they lost their faith in Him when they looked and they saw the circumstances that were in front of them. And so God then reminds them of His purpose for creating not just Israel, but the entire world. God reminds them of His purpose. And here's the purpose for you as well. And here's what we need to understand. Our world wants us to think that we are the problem with our world. That people are the problem. Save the whales, who cares about the people? Save the, save the globe. Who cares if it costs you your life or costs you your job? Who cares about those things? What matters is, see, we're the problem. Well, what God says is that when He created us, He said in Numbers 14 and verse 20, He says, So the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word, for indeed as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. God says He wants the world filled with the glory of the Lord. And when God made us, in the very beginning, we were created in God's image. Because that's the only way the Lord could fill the earth with His glory. Filling the earth with God's glory isn't God like shining down some kind of light on the world. It's when people do what God would do. And when we do that, then we are 
demonstrating the glory of God. In Genesis 1 and verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God made us in this world to be like him. But in order to be like Him, we need to understand something. In order to be like God, we have to listen to God. We can't be like God if we don't listen to God. And so when He created us, He created us with a certain kind of image that's different from the animals and different from the whales and different from the monkeys. He created us with an image that's like God's. And God's image, God's character, deals with us on the basis of love. Not a feely, wheely, mushy kind of love that you see on television. But a love that does what's good for people. God always does what is good. God is a good God. Amen. Satan wants you to think he's a terrible God. God wants you to know he's a good God. He even forgave these people as we take a look here and as we look. But God created us in his image because he wants the earth filled with his glory. But God will punish the unbeliever and bless the faithful. That's what you had in Numbers 14 and verses 22 through 25. Even though God called them, God wants us to understand that God is not going to make us serve Him. God is not going to say, I'm going to make them do what I, tell, what I want them to do, whether they like it or not. Now, there is a religious theory in the religious Christian world that actually teaches that, though they won't say it. It's called Calvinism. And basically what they say to you is that you can't come to God unless God picks you to come to Him. And so the only reason that some people are Christians is because God picked them and other people God didn't pick so they'll never, be a, they'll never be Christians and that flies in the very face of the character of God. God treats us in love. And love always gives people a choice. Or it isn't love. That's why God put the tree that they weren't supposed to eat in the garden. He didn't put that in there just to put it in there. He put it in there because he loved man and he has to give man a choice to figure out whether man's going to love him. And what man decided to do was love himself and love Satan. And we know the consequences of those activities. But God's, uh, God's care for his people has always been conditional. It's conditional on whether we're going to believe God or not believe God. That's what it depends on. Adam and Eve had the Garden of Eden. They were cast out. Why? Because it was conditional on what? On them listening to God. But yet God still loves us just like He still loves them. And so let me give you a brief summary between chapters 15 through 20 as we get into our text in chapter 21. And that is He reminds them in chapter 15 of the book of Numbers about sacrifice and judgment. God does bring judgment on them, but He also gives them a way to avert that judgment by the sacrificial system that He gave them that reminds us of Jesus that we looked at in our last couple of lessons. And then He reminds them of who it is that leads them in chapter 16 and 17 because there was an argument about who gets to lead them and God said Moses leads them. And Moses represents Jesus. Jesus leads them. Here's what I want you to understand. The Pope doesn't lead us. Mike doesn't lead us. Uh, uh, some council of men don't lead us. Some religion doesn't lead us. The only person who leads us is Jesus. That's who leads us. And the only person who leads you is not us. It's not the four elders that we have here that tell you what to do. We can't tell you to do anything. All we can do is try to share with you what the Bible says so you can figure out if you want to do what God says. So he reminds them of the leaders. In chapter 18, he then reminds them of their, the priestly duty and what the duty of the priest is. Well, if, if the... If God's our leader, then what do the priests do? The priests help people come to God. As Brother Don preached just a minute ago about you guys working. Our job is to help people come to Jesus. That's what our job is. And so he told them, remember to be purified. Remember purification that's found in God. And then in chapter 20, God is reminding us that he keeps his word. Do you remember what he said when the spies said, we can't go in the land? God said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to wander in the wilderness for the next 40 years. And every one of you that are 20 years and older who didn't think we could go into the land because you weren't trusting me is going to die in the wilderness. And your children are going to get to go in. And in chapter 20, we have where people and leaders are dying before they come into the promised land because God 
keeps his promises. All of that is the background for chapter 21, which is this little story about a bronze serpent stuck on a pole. And that's rather weird. And by the way, if you ever saw a doctor's card, on the doctor's card, if they have a symbol, they sometimes have a symbol of a pole with a snake wrapped around it. And you might go, what's that all about? We're going to learn what that's all about as we read this story. So let me remind you of the story. It's interesting that as you begin this story, it happens right after God gives them a victory. In Numbers chapter 21 and verse, and verse 1, it says, When the Canaanites, the king of Arad, fought against Israel and took some of them captive, so Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord heard the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. Then they utterly destroyed them uh, and their cities. Thus the name of that place was called Hormah. They had a problem. The Canaanites had come and taken some of their people and they didn't know what to do. So they prayed to God and they said, God, if you give us these people back and if you let us be victorious, we'll destroy these wicked people for you. And God said, fine. And they won. How many times in your life have you had a problem and you've asked God to help you and all of a sudden the problem either goes away or it no longer becomes a problem or it's solved. And then all of a sudden something else comes up that you don't like and instead of remembering what God has done for you, you complain to him. In Numbers 21 and verse 4, right after that little story, it says, Then they set out from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the journey. You remember last week we pointed out there's a reason why God put us in the wilderness. And remember that this is our wilderness. Some people think, this is great. We get to live it. No, this is a wilderness, God says. You look at the moral decadency of our world and of our country, especially lately. You look at the wicked things that are going on, and it is a wilderness of morality. Our leaders have no idea what it means to be moral. Our children commit adultery all the time, or commit fornication all the time, and they just think they're having a good time, and nobody tells them anything. Brother Albert sent me a little clip of some people who went to a school board, board meeting to complain about the books that our, that our middle school kids are required to read and all of the vulgar and, and suggestive language that was in, in those books. We live in a wilderness. And you might say, well, why in the world did God put us in here? Because God is trying to teach us to depend on Him Instead of depending on science or depending on politics or depending on some political party to rescue you and take care of you. God says, I'm the one who's going to take care of you. And they became impatient with God, like if God doesn't know what he's doing. And verse 5 says, And they complained, and the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. Well, wait a minute. They're getting food from heaven every single day. They go out and they collect what's called manna. And they're living, they're actually being sustained in the wilderness where there is no food. And they're complaining to God because they don't have a variety to eat. <clears throat> a lot of our children have a lot of trouble. And you know why? Because the parents give them too many choices. What do you want to eat? What do you want for Christmas? What do you want for your birthday? Give me a list. Instead of, look, this is what you're going to get. And you need to be thankful for what you get. You need to be thankful for, for what God has given you. But our children are raised with all kinds of, of choices. And we run around giving them all these choices and trying to make them happy by giving them choices. And God says, no, they just need to live. Our job is to keep our children alive. Not to give them Air Jordans. Not to give them Gucci purses. Our job is to keep our children alive and faithful to God. 
And they're complaining that God is doing that. You know why? Because they look at the world. They look at what the rest of the world has. I want that, and I want that, and I want that, and I want that. Just like Eve looked at the tree and goes, I want that. God said, you eat that, you die. She says, I want it. I want to be a movie star. I want to be an American Idol. I want people to worship me. And so the Lord sent them a physical picture of their spiritual reality. Verse 6 says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And you might go, how cruel. No, here's what you need to remember. They were already dead. They were already dead. Because if you're not trusting God, you are dead. You know why? Because there's only one being who gives life. That's God. God is the only one who gives life. I don't care what scientists tell you today. Scientists want you to think that somehow you came from some little oozy things in the ocean when the, when the temperature was just right and the chemicals were just right and that's where you came from. The problem is they haven't been able to do anything about it. Only one person who gives life and that's God. And if you reject God, you're dead. You're dead. So since they're dead, God says, let me give them a physical picture of what, why they're dead. And it says, and the Lord sent fiery serpents. Oh, that serpent. Remember we talked about what we're supposed to eat, about you know the cloven hooves and all. Remember that lesson? If you don't remember that lesson, you might want to go back and listen to it. But you remember the snake? Before he, cur before he lied to Adam and Eve, you remember he walked on apparently all fours. But after he lied, God says, now you're going to crawl on your belly and eat the dust of the ground. And that's who we listen to when we listen to Satan. And so a fiery serpent comes along the people and bit the people so that many people of Israel died and God had every right to do that. Because God created people. God created the world. And He sent people and many of them died. What I find interesting is it says many and not all. But God was doing it because He's trying to bring them to a recognition of their sin. And in chapter 21 and verse 7 it says, So the people came to Moses and said, We've sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you intercede with the Lord that He may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. And the people come to God and they say, Yes, we've sinned. We shouldn't have done it. We're wrong. Lord, will you help us? Why should he? Why should he? All the movies on television tell us, no, what you want is revenge. If somebody does you wrong, you want to hurt them. You want to destroy them. Kill them if you can. And make it painful in the process. Why in the world should God do anything but that? Because He loves us. That's why. Because He loves us. And so they interceded to... wanted Moses to intercede for them. And remember, Moses represents Jesus. Jesus. And so God provided for them. Out of His goodness and out of His grace, He provided for them. In chapter 21, and verse 8, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard... And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will, die, he will live. God says, now what you got to do, if you're running around out in the wilderness while you're picking your manna or you're picking your quail or whatever God has given you, and you happen to get bit by one of these fiery serpents, you now look to the center of the city of Israel, and you look up there, and there's going to be a long pole, and there's going to be a bronze snake on top of it. And if you look at it, you will live because that's the way medicine works. Have you ever gotten a prescription from the doctor that says, look at a bronze snake on a pole? <laughs> well, how come they lived? Because God said so. That's why. God said so. It wasn't because there was some secret formula. 
in a snake on a pole. It's because God says if you look at that snake, that fiery snake, that snake that's been judged, which is why it's on fire, that fiery snake, if you look at that snake, that fiery snake on that pole, God says you will live. It's only by His graciousness and by His goodness that He allowed them who are bitten to live. And verse 9 says, And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to this bronze serpent, he lived. There's two things that are required of you when this happens. One, you have to know you're bitten. Two, you have to know where to look. And three, actually, you have to look. You have to look. One of the main problems in our world is we don't teach people about sin anymore. We teach them about diseases and addictions and society made you that way. It's really not your fault. If you had a wife who really loved you, you wouldn't be drinking. If you had a husband who really loved you, 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 you wouldn't want to go out and, and, and spend all that money shopping that you know you don't have but that makes you feel good like if you're worth something. You see, the world tells us everything that it tells us so that you don't feel bad about sin because it doesn't want you to feel bad about sin. And our world has come to an apex where they tell people, you know, I feel like a girl. And instead of saying, that's sinful, you need to change your thinking, we go, oh, let me help you. And let me mutilate you. Right. So that your feelings are validated. You gotta know you're a sinner. And two, you gotta know where to look. And three, you have to look. Amen. You have to look. Now, did he just put that story in there to give them some physical things to do? Out of all of the history of Israel that they wandered in 40 years, we have a few pages. And in those few pages, you had the story of the bronze serpent. And where it is used and quoted in the New Testament is in John chapter 3. But before we get to where it's quoted, you have to understand the context. There was a man named Nicodemus who came to Jesus, and he was a good, sinful ruler. And you might say, my Bible doesn't say he was sinful. Let me explain that to you in just a minute. Let's read John 3 and verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus comes and he says, Jesus, I know you're from God. Now, Nicodemus was a ruler. Nicodemus was a Jew. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Now, you might say, what's all I have to do with anything? Well, a Pharisee is the strictest religion in their day. A ruler was somebody who had the right to be able to teach other people what to do. And he understood that Jesus was from God, so he was caring about what God said. But you notice up there I put Nicodemus a good sinful leader? Because what you have to understand is God says everybody's been bitten. Every single one of us has been bitten. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You think Nicodemus ever lied to his parents? Think Nicodemus ever tried to deceive somebody? You think Nicodemus maybe didn't quite keep all of God's commandments the way he ought to? Do you think maybe Nicodemus, maybe he taught somebody to do something that wasn't quite right because that the best he could do? You think maybe some of that happened? Then he was a sinner and he was bitten. You see, you don't have to be a drug addict to know you're bitten. You don't have to know that you're an adulterer to know you've been bitten. God says if you've lied, you've been bitten. God says if you disobeyed your parents, you've been bitten. God says if you disobeyed, disobeyed authority, you've been bitten. God says if you speak bad of your rulers, you've been bitten. God says if you've complained, you've been bitten. We have all been bitten. And sometimes our biggest job is to convince people that they have been bitten because until you realize you're bitten, 
I don't need a doctor. I don't need a snake on a pole. And so he comes to Jesus thinking that he was good. That's why we have this story in here. And in verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, after Nicodemus recognized that Jesus is from God, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is scratching his head and probably going, Wait a minute. I am a Jew by birth. I was born into the right family. I follow the right religion. I'm trying to keep the right rules. And Jesus says that somebody has to be born again to see the kingdom of God? Because God is the one who decides entrance into his kingdom. God is the one who decides when people will live who are bitten by a snake. In John 1 and verse 12 it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He says, that as many as received him, God gave them the right to become children of God. You see, you have to come to him. And God decides when sins are forgiven. You might say, oh, well, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, so I'm going to go out and help people and I'm going to do good. Well, that's great. But that's not how your sins are forgiven. In John 8 and verse 24, it says, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. And by the way, when He says, unless you believe that I am He, right here, this, this He is actually not in the Greek, it's just I am. That's the same name that God used when He talked to Moses in the burning bush, and Moses said, they're going to ask me your name, He says, tell them, I am. That means God has always been in the present, in the past, in the future, and will always be. He is the I am. I don't care what time you are or what dispensation you come from. God is there. Always has been, always will be. Which is really wonderful because it means God can always take care of me. And God's the one who decides when sins are forgiven. And that's why in Acts 2 and verse 38, the very first sermon that was preached when they said, you need to call the name of the Lord to be saved, Peter said this, this to them in Acts 2, 38. Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God says that's when your sins are forgiven. And so Nicodemus had the idea, though, that it was personally earned. Nicodemus in verse 4 said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Now notice the emphasis on can he. Can he be born again? Can he enter his mother's womb? Can See, this is stuff that he's doing that he thinks is earning his way to heaven. I go to church every Sunday. That's why I'm going to heaven. I read my Bible every day. That's why I'm going to heaven. No. No. You're going to heaven because you believe in Jesus. You're doing what he wants you to do. And, as Don pointed out, we do the other things because we appreciate God so much. We want to read His Word because we want to learn about Him. We want to tell people about Him because we want them to have their relationship with God that we do. So we do all those things and we come to church because we like singing with people and we like seeing our family. By the way, this is a family we're spending eternity with. Because God offered it by grace. He offered it by grace. When they asked God, do something, God could have said, no. But instead, He was gracious to them. And by the way, He was also merciful. But God saves us by His grace. In Ephesians 2 and verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. See, as we believe in Him. And that not of yourselves, this is a gift of God, and that is a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. He's pointing out that He saved us by His grace if we believe Him. Can you imagine the first person that got bit by a snake? And he says... I'm supposed to look at a pole with a snake on it? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I don't believe it. 
I'm not going to do it. And you know what happens? He dies. Nicodemus says, what do you mean I have to be born again? And so Jesus says, no, Nicodemus, it requires a spiritual birth. Only the spiritual minded enter. And you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do I have to be a psychic? Do, do I have to become some kind of, of guru or some kind of, of, of mystical person where I now will all of a sudden become spiritual? And the answer is, that's what the world tells you. That's what the world says. Not what God says. John 3 and verse 5 and 6, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of Spirit is Spirit. You see, Jesus had to give us a physical birth to understand the spiritual birth. Because it's very difficult for God to speak about spiritual things because we have no spiritual background for it. He can only use physical things to tell us of these spiritual realities. He says that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So God wants us to be born of the spirit. And how are you born of the spirit? Do you sit around and meditate and go, Oh God, please come into my life. I want you to make me spiritual. By the way, I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. I'm just trying to get you to understand what some people believe, what some people teach. Some people think that's the way you get spiritual money. You go in a dark closet and you hum and you talk and you chat and you wait for God to come talk to you and then all of a sudden you get some visions or something and that makes you spiritual. Not what God says. You want to know what God says? Here's what God says. Romans 8 and verse 12 says, So then, brethren, we are no we are uh, we are... Uh, under obligation, not to the flesh. So as you think about whatever the flesh means and whatever the spirit means, it means you become obligated to it. Whatever it is, you decide to become obligated to it. Here's what he says. To live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. What does that mean? Well, what that means is if I live according to me and my body and myself, I am going to eventually, physically, I will die. But spiritually, I will also die because the only giver of life I have rejected. If I reject God, I am rejecting the giver of life. There is no other life outside of Jesus, outside of God. There is no other life. You're going to cease to exist. You're going to be destroyed, God says. But he says, For if you live according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let's go back to the garden. God said, who is spiritual, don't eat the fruit. When you eat the fruit, you die. Satan, who crawls on the ground, says, no, God lied. You can't believe him. You can't trust him. You can eat the fruit and you'll be happier, basically. And she believed him. And the world became cursed. And we live in a cursed world. So the question is, those whom the Spirit moves are spiritual minded. In John chapter 3 and verse 7, he says, Do not be, Jesus says to, to Nicodemus, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. He says, The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. He says, you don't have to see the Spirit. He says, just like you don't have to see the wind. But you know when, the, when it's windy, my wife says, it's windy outside. She says, uh, I say, how do you know? She says, man, because our trees are blowing like crazy. She gets mad at me. She gets upset with me because sometimes I come in and she says, it's windy. And I say, I don't know. Don't pay attention to those things sometimes. The only way you know if it's windy is, is the trees blowing. If you can't see the Spirit, how do you know when you're being moved by the Spirit or when the Spirit is moving? And the answer is, He's moving you. You see, those who allow the Spirit to lead them are spiritual minded. In Psalms 143 and verse 10, He says, Teach me to do your will. Okay? He's talking about teaching you. He says, For you are my God. Well, great. How do, how do I let you teach me, Lord? He says, 
Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. The good spirit leads. What was God doing in the wilderness with Israel? He was leading them in the wilderness. How does God lead us today? By His Spirit. You might say, am I again supposed to go in the closet and wait for God? Okay, God, give me a spirit. <laughs> no. God gave you a book that was written by the Holy Spirit through the agency of people so that you could know what the will of God is. And He wrote it down so we could have it for future generations. It's called the Bible. And if you read the Bible, if you study the Bible, then you want to know the spiritual things of, the, of God. But if you're more concerned with football and Hallmark and tennis and whatever else you might like in the world, then maybe we're more attuned to the flesh than we are to the spirit. Because he tells us that the way God leads us is by the spirit. And notice that it says he leads us. He doesn't push us. He doesn't hurt us like cattle. He doesn't make us. He leads us. Those who allow the Spirit to lead, they're the spiritual minded people. And they're the ones who are born again. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth, by the way, where's the truth come from? God and the Holy Spirit. Since you have become obedient to the, uh, uh, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your soul for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart, for you have been born again. Here's how you're born again, not of the seed which is perishable but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. If the word of God tells you you have to be born again, then that's what you do. If the word of God says you have to look at that snake up there on that pole in order to live, that's what you got to do. He says, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. If you're listening to the world, and you look at Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was Conan the Barbarian, you go, that's the way I want to look. Look at it today. <laughs> the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever so the question is do you want to follow the world and the flesh that's eventually going to come to an end or do you want to follow the spirit and God and Jesus and do what God says so that you can live forever so understanding the bronze serpent verse 9 Nicodemus says to Jesus how can these things be? I don't get it. And remember, he's a ruler of Israel. He's supposed to have dealt with the word of God. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? He says, So you're the guy who teaches Israel? No wonder Israel doesn't know these things. Because they are spiritually discerned. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12, he says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Where in the world did this book come from? God. He wrote it down. So you'd have the spiritual information that God wanted you to have. Because God wants to lead you. Because God is the only source of life. But you have to believe in Him and trust Him. You have to look at the serpent on the pole. In John 3 and verse 11, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we, what we know and we testify of what we have seen and you do not accept our testimony. He says there's only one way to, there's only one way to know these things and that's if you experience them. You have to experience these things. Well, here's our problem. I'm from down here. Nicodemus is from down here. How in the world am I going to experience the things up there if I'm from down here? How will I know? Because physically explaining spiritual truths is difficult. Look what he says in verse 12. 
If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He says, I gave you a physical illustration and you still don't understand it. He says, are you going to, are you going to be able to figure it out if I tell you spiritual things? The problem is, is we have no perspective because we're from here. But Jesus is from both realms. In John 3 and verse 13, he says, No one has ascended into heaven. If somebody says to you, I've gone up to heaven. I had a near-death experience. I went up to heaven. Well, they had a vision, but it wasn't heaven. There's only one person that's been up there and come down from there. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus says, do you want to know heavenly things? Then you have to ask the right person. If you have a car problem, you don't go to a plumber. <laughs> Jesus says, I know what heaven is like because I was there. So now, verse 14, he gets to the serpent. He says to Nicodemus in verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, what was the purpose for Satan, for the serpent to be put on the pole? So that if you look, you'll live. Jesus says, I have to be crucified. I have to be stuck on a pole. What's the purpose for that? Because God loves you. He doesn't want you to perish. He loves you. He doesn't want you to listen to Satan. He loves you. I don't care what the world's told you about God. God loves you. And John 16 and verse 11 says this. And I want you to notice this. I want you to pay real close attention to this. He says in verse 11 that... When the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to convict the world of certain things. He says, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. What does it really mean when God judges somebody? You might say, well, He destroys them. But does He destroy them just because He likes things destroying people? What does it mean when God judges them? And how, when Jesus died on the cross, did He judge Satan? When Jesus died on the cross, did that automatically make Satan dead? Was he automatically destroyed? No. Well then, what does he mean by judgment? Well, let me tell you first of all what Satan does. Job 1 and verse 9. God's looking down the earth. The children of, uh, He says the sons of God are up there with him. Satan is up there with him. God's looking down. He says, hey, have you guys noticed my servant Job? Look at how much he loves me. Now, as I tell you this story, here's what you need to remember. God created him. God made him. God put him down there. God gave him everything. That's kind of like you building a house, and you're looking back, and you're standing, and you're looking at your house, and you go, man, I like my house. That's a nice looking house. And all of a sudden, the inspector comes along, and he says, the two-by-fours aren't good enough. The roof is going to leak. The windows aren't going to keep anything out. And you're going, it's been working so far. And Satan comes along to God and says, does Job fear God for nothing? He says, yeah, of course. Of course he loves you. You give him everything he wants. You see, what I want you to think about, what is it Satan's really saying? What Satan is really saying is real simple. He's saying, that guy isn't worthy to keep around. That's what he's saying. You think he loves you, God, but he's not worth keeping around. The only reason he keep, you, he, he's around is because you give him everything he wants. So you remember what God did, right? God said, okay, Satan, do whatever you want to with him, but don't kill him. Satan took away his property, took away his respect, took away his children, took away his house, took away everything. What did Job do? He said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He still trusted the Lord. And so Satan came in the second chapter, 
and answered the uh, and answered the, uh, the Lord and said, "Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. Because if you have your health, you have every. Isn't that what they tell you? If you have your health, you have everything. That's all that matters is your health." However, put, your, put, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. God says, you make him sick. So he had boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his foot. He couldn't stand, he couldn't sit, he couldn't squat, he couldn't lay down, he couldn't lay on his stomach, he couldn't lay on his back without pain. And the worst thing is, Satan. God said to Satan, don't kill him. See, that would have put him out of his misery, but no. He's going to be miserable. You see, what Satan wants God to think is that you are not worthy of rescuing or having or being here, and that's what the world tells you. But in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, it says, Then I heard a loud voice of heaven saying, Now salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accused them before God day and night. See, when you start accusing people, guess whose side you've jumped to? When you start saying, That guy's not worthy to be saved. You know whose side you've just jumped onto? I don't care what the guy did to you. I don't care how bad he treated you. When you say that, you've jumped over there on that other side. But what was Jesus' judgment on the cross? In Luke 23 and verse 34, as he's dying on the cross, it says, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive the husband who divorced me for a younger woman. God, forgive my wife who cheated on me with another man. Lord, forgive my financial advisor who gave me bad advice. <laughs> Lord, forgive me, forgive the guy who came into my house and robbed it. We look at them and we go, they're not worthy to live. But God's judgment is, I can save them. I made them. I want them. They're my house. And I will save them. Because eternal life is only found in Jesus. Verse 15 of John 3 says, So that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. They had eternal life because they looked and they saw the pole with a snake on it. And they lived because God was merciful and gracious to them. You committed adultery? You lied? You cheated? You stole? You embezzled money? You haven't been caught yet? And the guilt is following you around? You've lied to people about the stuff you've done? And the guilt is eating you up? Look at the pole. Jesus can heal you because He loves you and wants us. And that's why in Mark 16 and verse 15 and 16 you have to look. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. You think there's life somewhere else? I'm telling you, there isn't. Which is why the resurrection is the proof of all of this. And that's why we die with Jesus in baptism. Because that's when we look at the pole. Because Jesus died for us and we die in baptism for Him. And living in the wilderness is often difficult. I know that. God knows that. But the question isn't have we been bitten? We have. It's are we looking at Jesus to live those who look to Jesus lifted up on the cross are baptized in His name so as to live. If you haven't done that, you might say, I don't know enough. You know Jesus died for you. You know you're a sinner. You know you need to come to Him. It's good enough. You might say, well, I still have problems with addictions. That's why God wants to help you. Come to Him. Find power in Him. 
By the way, that's what the resurrection day is all about. It's about God's way of saving us and the proof that God gives life after death. And Jesus is our life. Sandra Hollowell, and uh, she had a couple falls and, and all, and she ain't doing too well. If you could keep her in your prayers for me, I, I appreciate it. Um, I did see you know, somebody's having. I keep on thinking I got announcements. <laughs> Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, so much for bringing us here today. I'm so pleased to uh, share this Easter Sunday with my brothers and sisters. I see a lot of smiling faces and bright colors. Ah, Lord, you're so awesome. We just I thank you for all the many blessings that we have. Uh, I love you with all my heart. And I thank you for everything. I know we all just thank you and wish you in our lives to lead us and guide us through this next week, Lord. Uh, keep us in your mind, Lord. We just need you and we love you. My name, your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, the Easter Bunny did come by my house yesterday. <laughs> Lorraine, she came over here. I think she's part of Bunny Rap. She brought me a whole box of eggs. <laughs> I don't know where she got it from. like to see a resurrection, we hope you hang around for a few minutes. Let me just remind you of some announcements to be made. Uh, the Parkers uh, need to be in prayer. I see Terry back there, so I'm glad he's feeling better. Uh, they had COVID. Uh, remember, Sunshine, Sunshine has COVID, and keep her in your prayers if you would. Uh, keep Nedra in your prayers. She's been having some health problems along with her daughter. Uh, keep her in your prayers. Uh, ladies' Fellowship is next Sunday. Servants' Meeting is next Sunday also. Uh, that's all that I have, other than the fact that May the 13th is going to be our picnic. And uh, if you'd like to stay around, hang around, Troy has something to say. Uh, yeah, we were going to try to have a little camping deal at the property that Lee knows about instead of the picnic. Okay. But all the rain we have, it's out there on the delta, and it was under four feet of water. Okay. So by the time we were going to do it from May 5th, but by the time that water recedes, the ground's still going to be mushy. 
Right. All right. All right, so if you hang around a little bit, let me turn this off and we will be done.